Okay, uh, it's February 28th, 5.05 p.m. and I'm calling tonight's regularly scheduled meeting of the Town of Waitley Planning Board order. Um, first item up on our agenda, there are, well, we're going to start with an application for an approval not required for a parcel um, on Wilbur Road. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be over here. I'm going to share. We have physical maps of the ANR here. And I'm going to do a share screen from this other laptop. So, Brent, what was that name? Um, it's an ANR, an approval not required for, for... beans at on oh, Weber. The beans are now. Okay, thank you. Okay. So share my screen. I'm going to share. This one. Done this right. You should all be able to see this map. Okay. All right. Now, um, typically we give the, we open with a little overview of the, the plan from property owner and or the surveyor. How would, uh, well, who, I mean, who would who would like to lead this? Harlan, you're here. Brett, doesn't matter to me. I mean, basically, it's pretty <clears throat> self-explanatory what we're trying to do here. Um, we've cut out that piece of property for hopefully Brett and Kaylee to build their house up on the top of the hill. The that's this. Um, it's not quite a flag. It's a flag like it was supposed to be a flag lot, but uh, some different interpretations. We rescinded that application with the ZBA and decided that this was a much, this was a better option. Okay. Um, so it's not designated a flag one. It is not a there. flag one. No. Okay. No, it has its legal product. Sure. It has its legal product. Now, the only quirk with this lot is my mother's driveway, which is property that my mother and I, you know, I own and she has a life estate there. Um, if you look at the bottom where Brett Kaylee's driveway is, you know, their property comes into this, Weber Road, that triangle there. Yes. Um, that is, that would be, my mother's driveway would be on that piece of property. Okay. So um, this is your mother's house. Yep. House number 81. Yep. Existing driveway traverses that little triangular yep. piece. Exactly and, and right. Exits to the road. Um, at the frontage of the flag. Yep. Or the non flag. Non flag. Frontage of the lot. Oh, that's right. And Could so. You, oh, I'm sorry. Could you just clarify for me why you say that uh, without this additional triangular portion, this lot has the required frontage? No, with the triangle. Portion. Yes. That's right. I misunderstood. Yes. With the way we have it now, it, it's not a flag. Lot. The way we would like it. With this ANR is not a flag lot. Yes, understood. Yeah, it is shaped similar to a flag lot. Right. It's flaggy, but not but yeah, to to not require a flag lot, that's why we've included this in the book, you know, or, or um putting an easement at, to my mother's driveway. So right. the 200 square limit of feet frontage. Yep. Yeah, the 200 feet of frontage for lots without public water. That's right. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um so uh, that where it says proposed drive to match existing going down for your mother's, that's yeah. not going to be built. So, the, so that where it's slashed is her is her actual driveway. Yeah, yeah. The proposed drive match line. Yeah. I'm asking for a courtesy on the town's part. My mother just turned ninety years old. Yep. Yeah. She's battling with some things that you can imagine a ninety year old woman is. Right. And yeah. the last thing we would like to do is add any confusion, disruption okay. to her life. Sure. And, uh, you know, we feel it's her driveway is technically, you know, off that lot anyways, as you can all see. Right. Uh, and has been for years and years and decades and decades. But the last thing I and my family would like to do is upset my mother. Sure. Okay. Sure. So if um, in the future, if you sort of sell that property, you you it would be possible to make that go down on her percent. frontage. Yeah, but right now, you don't want to disturb Yeah, it. she has plenty of frontage on okay. that lot. So, it, it, you know, by doing this triangle, it doesn't, like, yeah. you know, she still has a compliant lot. Mm -hmm. I see. 
So let me just make sure I fully understand what you're saying and what we might potentially be agreeing to or and also understand what we have the power and authority to agree to, right? Um, so you're saying that that the the ANR request before us is to modify the the existing parcel that doesn't have that triangular piece and simply add that triangular piece to it. Yep. And that is the an extent of the ANR request for the purpose of enabling converting this lot, uh, giving it the required frontage so it could be a building lot. Correct. And then your what you're saying is that right now the current situation, the current use of the land has this existing driveway to your mother's house going through that triangular piece. But what you somebody else said, Lauren's by the way. Okay, so Lauren's coming. She thought it was six. Very good. So um so what you're you would like to do is leave the existing driveway in place. Essentially this is a, an arrangement between within your family, right? Because Kaylee and company yeah. will presumably object um to having you know in some sense, somebody else's driveway running through their property. Yeah. But um, but that's the idea. Now, what you're saying is that if and when that um, house eighty one lot is sold, it would it would be a mat. So then the, the house eighty one yeah. actually has two driveways. The yeah. second one is not shown. The okay. second driveway is on the other side. Um, so, but the garage and everything is accessed through this driveway. So that's why. You know, in the future, and in that let in in the ANR request, I believe it has a time, 120 days, roughly, um, from. So I'm sorry, in the ANR, I did see Kaylee sent a quit claim deed. Yes, that and that's it. You okay, that, I don't think we have the paper of the quit claim deed. Has it arrived? I didn't actually notice it until today. Um, so it was a. Uh, but I, I have it and I can share it. It's, it's completely reasonable what you guys want to do. Yeah. I would think so. It's completely reasonable. In my mind. While I'm while I'm looking, I thought I had saved that. Uh, the way you're looking, could you explain what the driveway is that's drawn on the lot 81 that goes to the road? So Judy, do you mean this part that's marked as proposed to match existing or this existing? Yeah. Proposed to match existing. That is that what proposed, proposed to match match existing is not there right now. That driveway is not built. That is not but, but you are planning to? No. No. I thought that, that was time, a proposal. I, Hopefully my mother stays, you know, living for a long time and, and we don't have to disrupt anything for a long time, but at some point potentially that would be moved. Okay. Because I it was my impression that that was the application for the common driveway. To do. Okay, fine. No, the common driveway application is on the other side. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's see. There. Are there any other questions? I I don't think we need the quick claim deed, do we, Grant? It's pretty I straightforward. Don't, I don't see why I looked at it, and it it feels to me that that's not something within the. I mean, yes, I suppose we could consult with council independently to confirm whether the quick claim deed is satisfactory, but this is a deep, an arrangement between yeah, consenting exactly. family members. You, yeah. you said there's already a driver on the other side yeah. of the property as well. Yeah. So right. this is, I mean, yeah. your father was a farmer. So yeah. it's always just farm access to I mean, it's, 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 Yeah, this is an this ancillary one. access to the back of the property. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I do understand, okay. Um, as far as I can tell from reviewing the, the else is joining. Um, this looked entirely consistent to me with the the rules of 
A and R's. Judy, do you concur with that? I mean, I've looked at the. Yes, I think it's quite a straightforward A and R. Yeah. Okay. All right. I in these meetings, I try to consistently just play the role of a meeting moderator. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to do is hear a motion from somebody to approve this A and R plan as submitted. I will make a motion to approve the beams A and R. Okay, the motion has been second. made. We hear a second. Who is that? Judy. Judy seconded it. So Sarah made the motion to approve the ANR and uh, Judy seconded it. So we'll do our usual hybrid party roll call. Um, all in favor, Sarah. Aye. Uh, in fact, I'm not asking. I'm just asking for your vote. So yes. Sarah is aye. Judy. Aye. Uh, JD. Aye. Grant, I'm I. Uh, I know Laura joined, but she came too late to, um, I think she came partly and so she'll simply, Laura, you're hearing us? Yes, I do hear you. I got on at, I think like 5.08. I apologize, I was a little behind. Um, not a problem, but-, but I think um, she technically should not, can't vote. She didn't yeah, have a full discussion. Exactly right. Does that, so she would simply not vote or record as abstaining? I think she just can't, just okay. doesn't vote. And we have four out of four votes is sufficient. Mm -hmm. So the ANR is approved by those four votes. Um, what we're going to do, we are going to, what we want to do, because you're here, and you came to the party, we're going to sign the MILAR, which is what you need, and sign the one of the applications. I can report that we have all the necessary copies of all the paperwork. Thank you. We don't always get that level of compliance, which is wonderful. I can report that we did receive the application fee check, which I will turn over to the um, treasurer collector at the soon as possible opportunity. Uh, so what we're not going to do, we, we can sit, we can, because we want to move on with the agenda, we're going to do the minimum signing so Harlan can, can take off. And are you guys going to... And then we're going to talk about the common drive. And Judy, I want to plant in your head this question of, um, was partly in the common drive discussion, and this relates to what we may talk about towards the end of the meeting. I know Michael... Busa has uh, joined the, um, the question of if the principal, if the planned house or the planned residential use for parcel B, the original parcel, the, the non flag parcel, or let's just say the new parcel after everything's added. Yeah. If the construction plan, which I thought I saw in the common drive permit, was placing the residential structure beyond the AR1 line into the AR2 line, which I believe it is. You see the dotted line? Um, so there's a question, Judy, I was going to ask you about if the residential use for this parcel is in AR2, does the frontage for AR2 have to be met for the entire parcel, which would be a huge problem. And I hope that's so. I'm I'm conjured. I mean, I don't. It think. has come up with the bylaws. I don't think we're going to have that problem. But I want you to, Judy. Would you do me a favor while we're doing a little signing here to think about that issue? So I have the mylar here. Oh. This is a problem. Sure. No, we don't have a quorum of people here it's okay. to sign. I don't need that mile. Okay. All right. right. And there's there's no rush on our okay. my part to get or anything. I was hoping get that mile. We would have at least three no. people present That's um, to do the signing. No. All right. So we're just going to simply we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get the on. signing done and I'll let you know as soon as everything's ready for you to yeah. uh, or the or Bailey or Brent right. to pick up. And it will not, it will not be a, a lengthy period of time. I can come down tomorrow morning and sign. Okay. We'll make sure to have all of this put, Sarah. I, I, 
Well, as before, we'll have it in the in the yeah. our office down the hall from here, like I did before. Remember, so we'll do that. All right. So, can you scroll that out of the map so we can see more of it? Sure. Usually, I should be able to do it this way. Uh, okay. Oh, no wonder because I'm sharing the screen for the different things. Just so we can kind of see the yeah. whole. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect right there. Okay. That, that's more than enough. Yeah, right. Because yeah. the parcel extends down into this area. That's beautiful right there. Okay. Now, obviously, people can't see me. Do you mind if I give a little overview of mm -hmm. what's happening, what we'd like to happen, and where we are? With yes, I right? would. And let me just just sort of preface this where with to do because we're now pivoting, we're moving on to, yep. to the discussion of, the, of the common driveway. Exactly right. We cannot. We have to do a formal public hearing for that because yep. it's a special permit issued by the planning board, and that requires posting in a newspaper record for two weeks. And so we're going to schedule that. So tonight we're just you know, Brad, to... Yes. Brad, this common driveway is in existence. I think you're on the wrong plan, Brent. No, this is you not, need to move to yes, the common driveway. No, this is not the common driveway plan that we're looking at. This is still the ANR plan. I'm just talking to Harlan for a moment, just a little bit about the. Process. I mean, you can see if the common driveway plan shows all this, you can put that map up. Yeah, it does. that's what I'm planning on doing. So give me. I will say um, the only thing with the common drive one that I sent you, I'll have to get you a little bit of an updated one. If you can see the. West property line bulges out like 50 feet more than the ANR one that we applied for. That was just a miscommunication. We did so many different layouts that the wrong one just ended up with the driveway information on it. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. But I will get you guys the one with the property line tucked in a little bit more on that west side um, before the actual um, meeting for the permit. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it matters much for this one, but yep, she's right. Yeah, yeah. So, and all of the materials for the public hearing will have to be to us and able to be posted at the time we advertise the public hearing. Okay. So, just, I mean... Brent, I'd like to question whether, whether we, in fact, need to approve a common driveway because it appears that this driveway is already crossed the lot line onto the old property. And it's been in existence probably since before the zoning was put in. Is this um, the case? That's not my understanding. My understanding is this road that follows the, I guess you call it the Western boundary. So let me, I now I have a little this, walking road. Here. This, 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 this That's all road random. is to be built. It, has not just stop, it currently stops right there. I see. So, so there's an existing road that goes up to this existing structure, which, was, which is within the AR1 boundary. So yeah. this is the AR1 Correct. boundary. So there's an existing driveway, and what you want to do is extend that drive. That existing driveway was just put in in the last couple of months for Brad's house. Okay. Okay. So, Judy, does that change what you were saying? Okay. Fine. Fine. No, that's okay. So that is that new driveway to be constructed would be, well, I mean, I guess a portion of it is a common driveway in the parcel that- um, Oh yeah, it's a common right. driveway yeah. for all of this. Yeah. So the reason, that, what I wanted to make sure everybody was clear on, the reason that the common driveway is, is very important to the whole family is most of Kaylee and Brett's lot, Yes. that part, what is that parcel? That's C, correct? Yeah, yeah. Most of their lot is field mm -hmm. that's currently used for hay, okay. it's been used for corn, and up here is used for pasture. Okay. We don't want to disrupt that. Yeah, we, you don't want to run a driveway or anything. We, 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 we farm. I mean, right. we have animals and we want to continue yeah. the agricultural use of that. Which was a priority for the town anyway. Right, right exactly. And this driveway here yeah. 
We put that in along, that's a fence line. We okay. put it along a fence line to preserve as much of the field. Okay. And it continues all the way up here okay. along a fence line. Okay. Yeah. Out of the field, out of mm -hmm. our usage. Right. On this side, there is a pond and a considerable amount of wetlands. Mm -hmm. So the common drive, that's why we needed this for their lot, because on right. this side is just too wet. Right, right. And um, the common drive just makes a ton of sense. So the family as a whole, mm -hmm. all of us can maintain that field, maintain that purpose. Right. So right. there's no issues breaching the stone wall. There, we don't have to cross the stone wall or anything. For the house. Oh, well, for the house. So the house, um, the stone wall was would be in their lot. Yeah. So I don't. I wouldn't think there'd be an issue. I don't know. But yeah, you, you're right. The very end of it would go across an old stone wall. What do you mean by pro like? I got, I, mean, I, got, like, I got in trouble in Williamsburg years ago building a house because I reached a stone wall over the driveway in. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was a scenic road. But it was a road a wall right at the end of the street. Oh, I, I didn't realize it. I had to get approval. Yeah. From the it had, that only applies within the town right of way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this dotted roadway here. That's a trail. That's an old logging trail. Okay. Yeah, that's right. a, okay. Quite often, if you go out in the woods, there's stone walls delineating property. Dogs right. Every yeah. Year. right. Yeah. Right. My dad's house is stone wall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah, that's, you know, we have a, you know, we use that as a path. Um, we do a little bit of deer hunting up there and okay. a few other things, and we okay. use that road to access okay. that pathway, but it's not a... All right, so you can't... And, and it's the, it's not a public hearing for the specific thing we can't... Tonight is can't, not the public hearing. We can't deliver it. All we, we, no, all I just we wanted can, everybody to understand and yeah. know our reason for wanting that common drive. But the point for tonight is to make sure if we see any red, you know, things that you might want to correct before a public hearing, this is our chance to provide you with that feedback. Mm -hmm. And then you have a chance to um, participate in uh, the scheduling of said public hearing. Okay. And the fire chief is good. No, we have not yet. I have not yet. I I did talk to um I have an email from him I could forward to you. I did reach out about it and he didn't have any issues with it. Um the grade stayed under that 12%. So he said it worked for him. Okay. This good. was Kaylee, that was from whom? James um let me check real quick. From the uh, from the fire chief. Yeah. From so yeah. Yeah. from from the, the police and fire have to provide approval and not the, police highway department, the public sorry, works. Thank you, Judy. And that driveway is already the access is already approved by Keith. So Keith was actually up on the site the other day. Okay. So then it'll be straightforward. The typical once I we announced once we start moving. I think forward, however I think they need a side lot access permit as well. They're not going through their frontage. Oh, um, this is side lot access permit. Could you say a little bit more about that? First, I've heard of that. And who? And well, it's, is in, that the same, it's in the same part of the bylaws as the as the um, com, common driveway. And in fact. The, the application forms are identical. You just check a different box. Um, if the planning board has the ability to waive the <laughs> standard requirement that, that a driveway go through the frontage on the lot, if there is, if it is technically feasible to do that, and but if there's a good reason like wetlands or wanting to preserve a pasture or something those those would be very good reasons but that also requires a special permit and a public hearing and a separate application form and unfortunately a separate fee but they, can be done to, they can be done it, together on the application it made it seem like it was a one or the other i might have just been reading it wrong but i did see that side law access well, it is and one or the other because you have to submit two applications but if you okay. read the back okay. if you read the back it says that unfortunately you have to if you if you're applying for both you need to submit two fees okay i can get that in then yeah it's it's it would be all part of the same public hearing it's essentially looking at the same map it's it's just unfortunately one more step Wait, there isn't a scenario where one is approved and one is disapproved. No, I can't see. 
Oh, I can't. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Yeah, no, I can't okay. see that. Um, okay. So one outcome of tonight is we've clarified that additional bit to get done, and there's still plenty of time to do this to get, sort of to give you. Well, I guess we we can start to talk about scheduling. Because one of the things that we've been working on on the planning board is some bylaw revisions where I was already anticipating scheduling a public hearing for the end of March for our regular end of March public, uh, regular meeting schedule. Um, and what I'd like to be able to do is not, I would like to not overload that next meeting with public hearings on bylaw revisions. And I guess what I'm rambling my way to is what is your, what's the urgency around this? I'll so, you can, yeah, I'll like, I get it done. I mean, yeah. break on April or you like May or June. Uh, we, we, Let me I put mean, it this way. We tried to do things all together a couple of years ago with these lots. Yep. Because both, both you know, the two lots were going to be required. And because we didn't do them at the same time, quick enough in the game yeah. it has brought us to a this year doing a little creativity yeah. which is yeah. fine yeah so our urgency is simply we'd like to get it done so right. any additional roadblocks right um like this side lot thing i'd like to you know i'll look at the bylaws right. and see if you know what the and we'll help applicability of that is to this right. you know if, if it could be waived you know, right. whatever but um, so that's that's our urgency. Okay. You, know, you, you really want to push forward. Yeah, and I don't think this would take more yeah. than five minutes. We've yeah. we've discussed it. There's there really aren't any obstacles. Yeah. So if they know, if I, they have the covenant and they will need a a maintenance covenant. Yeah, not on the part of the planning board by by no stretch. No, we've just had other obstacles that we should. Sure. Work. And so I I hear what you're saying, Judy, and you seem to be advocating. Because we haven't gotten to the part of tonight's meeting where we talk about and make final decisions about bylaw revisions that we want to get to annual town meeting. And annual town meeting is driving some hard deadlines for us. So my worst case scenario, Judy's advocating that we do all of our public hearings, including yours, at our next meeting at the end of March. I vote with Judy. <laughs> if we can do that. So I'm going to just simply I say right now, I'm, I'm with... I'm I'm playing my chair role. My worst case scenario is that it's either pushed for you till the end of April. That will, by the end of this meeting, we will know whether we think we can do this at the end of March. And if we can do it, if we want to delay it a little bit, it would be no later than the end of April, but we might be able to move it to somewhere earlier in April. I know that the building season starts earlier and earlier every year with the weather that we have now. And I know that bylaw changes, whether it would affect this or not, I don't know. But I know that they would like to get their building permit and, if possible, get going on this while the weather is good so they can build in good weather and, yes. and go from there. So, I mean, that's kind of the urgency. Understood. Um, we have a, a special planning board meeting? Well, we can, all, we can and do schedule ad hoc meetings if we can all pull this off. And I think Judy may be right that this is not a complicated thing. The main thing is getting all the paperwork done, getting the notices, getting the abutter letters out because we do have to send letters yeah. to all the affected abutters. So there's a certain amount of process in just making it happen. And I and I just want to be careful that we don't compromise work that the planning board's been doing for months now. Well, we so, can schedule a special meeting for the next week. If you mean the week after in early April, yeah, yeah, we yeah. have to. So, how about I mean, this? That's... Give us. We're, you guys work. We it will out. let you, you know, know what we're trying to do, and we can. respect and understand that you guys got ahead of you with the bylaws and town meeting. So, yeah. if we're all on the same page, that we'd like to, you know, have some urgency without putting you guys to a, a, a an unreasonable. Request. We'd appreciate it. Thank you. We will do this with all the speed. <laughs> all right. No, right. we take no, I, take I it seriously. And we're not just you know. Okay. Um, are there any 
other questions or concerns or feedback from any member of the planning board to the beans regarding the common driveway um, special permit and side lot special permit request. So right now all we have is the common driveway. So Kaylee's got the job of getting, working with us to get the side lot and I have to make sure I even understand what that is. We we do need a covenant. Yep, we yes. do have that and I'll get it to you guys. The covenant okay. has to do with the shared maintenance of the common driveway. Yep, we have that written up already so I could get that to it as well. Okay. It's all in the family, but still. Uh, no, <laughs> might, not be might not be forever. Right. When you just leave it to the family, that's how it gets when it gets confusing. Exactly. So right. Kaylee's on it. So. Um, okay. Besides, they don't have any choice. It's a requirement of the bylaw. Right. Okay. I just is this holding up? You're getting your well permits and your septic permits. Well, at some point, yeah. Especially if there's this, you know, the line there. Especially if some meteor falls out and you. Somebody determines there's got to be frontage changes or something that's going to be catastrophic. Yeah. Okay. You know. Yeah. Who do we go to to confirm that? Would that be what you guys decide on? No. How would we? We don't. No, we, don't. we don't. It's either Jim Hawkins. I think it's Jim Hawkins. Yeah. Okay. So I could reach out to him to just confirm that everything looks okay as well. Yep. It's easy to find him in his office at eight o'clock in the morning or eight thirty in the morning. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm almost reluctant at the later at tonight's meeting. Um, this question of what rules apply when residential uses are within the AR one boundary, within four hundred feet of the right of way, versus what rules apply when re pre residential uses are in the AR two zone, has one is one that's has come up with another parcel down the road in. Um, on Weber Road here, where it seems as though you take a parcel like yours and you divide it along that, maybe I'll, since I the benefit here. So let's not play acoustic chill. That, that this, this portion of the parcel, it's all one parcel, but the portion between the right of way and the AR1 line the AR1 rules apply when it comes to frontage and things like that. Grant, I don't think we're going to solve that tonight. Uh, no. Deborah Kearney has been a half an hour in this over the weekend. And um, it's very, very confusing. And I think we, we have to leave it to Jim Hawkins now. And if it turns out to be the wrong answer, then somehow we need to do a fix. But um, I just got uh, I encourage it's everyone. Not, it's not something we're going to resolve here. Yeah, when there's some of these issues that have a lot of gray area like that, you have to go back into your bylaws, into the town, anything to do with the town, the purpose of all these things, mm -hmm. and what the intent is. And, and yeah. our intent is clearly to limit the impact yeah. on the property. 100%. And, you know, adding... Frontage and doing this other thing and yeah. restricting my uh, the rest of our family's access to the remaining property and it, that, right. that would just right. you know that would deep that would go against what all of us want which right. is you know preservation of what yeah. we have and to work with it so right. you know no, we're just on, I, think, I think if Jim the answer is yeah go ahead Judy if Jim gives you the wrong answer I I'm wondering if maybe. This is something you could get a variance from from the yeah. CBA. They won't like. No, maybe that's not it. I think it's we, it's I, a problem I, that we created AR two. We, to, we didn't really allow think much about access, and um, and that's why it's so confusing. And yeah. So I hope I hope it's okay. <laughs> There's many answers to the same question sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so I believe we can declare victory for tonight on this agenda item. You. Yeah. you will still hear from me on the details of the signing when the materials for your A and R are ready. You can you can communicate right to with Kaylee. I will do that. All right. Yeah.
So great. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you via email. I don't think, Grant, I do not need it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. I'm really hard selling these cupcakes, I thought. It's going to be a big win. But I'm going to hear what's the big Brian's thing. Yeah. Well, wow, that was fun. Okay. So, um, do we have. Can we stop sharing? Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for that. Uh, I don't believe Sylvie. Sylvie is not here. We had an agenda item for a floodplain bylaw update. Judy, I saw there was some email between you and Sylvie, but there was an attachment, something she sent you that I that I wasn't sent to me. So do you have by any chance any floodplain? I can I'll give you, I'll try to give you a brief update, very brief, because I am not fully conversant, but she has spent time with Scott Jackson, and I think they have come to an agreement that the, the Conservation Commission can advise the floodplain administrator um, if there are clear principles upon which they do that. And the next step she has is to develop those clear principles. Um, she sent today a, excuse me, <clears throat> a document from FEMA that was about application of flood insurance, of the flood insurance program to agricultural structures. And it gave a lot of regulations by type of structure, which was very helpful. It also had one sentence in it that said that many state have exempted agriculture from, from their zoning requirements, but in order to be eligible for the flood plain and flood insurance, you had to obey the federal requirements. So I think that's that to some extent solves the one one state law saying one thing and one state law saying another. Um, for JD and Laura, the problem we've had with the floodplain bylaw is that it's a zoning bylaw, but the, the state exempts agriculture from most zoning. So it's been kind of a dilemma about how you apply, to what extent you could apply the floodplain bylaw to farms. And most of the area in our, huge portion of the area in our floodplain is farming area. So um, that's where we've been hung up. So I think if we can tell townspeople, we need to look to the federal regulations in addition to the zoning regulation that clarifies that a good bit. So Judy, I felt a, good about that. I have a quick question about that. What do we determine a farm? Is it the use of it being used? Is it income being derived from the land for farming? Is it the landowner leasing it to someone else to farm on it? Is it a hobby farmer? Is it it doesn't farmer? matter. It's, it's, it's the usage as a farm. Yeah. The so ownership doesn't issue, matter. Principal use. Principal use. Principal use. Yeah. So, so like Laura, Laura, zoning Laura has horses and chickens to she farm under this on her residence. Yeah. I think there yeah, is. That's her residential. Residential. Okay. That's that's what I want to know. Yeah. Okay. If you have a little. Yeah, issue. I think technically it might it might have to be more than five acres. In farming okay. or something, but um, Sarah, do you know? No, but but no, it's not. It's not we, no, chickens on your home lot wouldn't count, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I mean, the main use of that property, I mean, depending on the size of it, is most likely the, the majority of it is not the chicken coop and is the house. Mm -hmm. For what it's worth, I don't like. consider myself a farm. <laughs> All right. All right. So that's our that's our floodplain bylaw update for tonight. The okay. other thing that for Laura and JD is that we have to pass this floodplain bylaw to be eligible for FEMA disaster insurance for the town as well, or disaster help. 
there aren't very many people who have flood insurance, federal flood insurance. There are some, but but I think everybody cares about FEMA. So mm -hmm. it's it's a necessary obligation to get this passed. Okay. Um, but so so Sylvie, I chatted with her briefly today. She said, "Oh, I'm hoping we can get it to town meeting." And I said, no, <laughs> there just certainly isn't time for that. I, she's got to develop the principles. We have to educate people. We have to. Um, right. But anyway, I feel better about it than I have in a long time. Good, good. And what was your last under? They kept moving the deadline for when this bylaw had to be passed by a town. The only definitive deadline that I know at this point is that if we get a new FEMA map, it has to be passed within six months of that being published. But since they've been, last I knew that they were hoping to get one out in 2025, but they hope to get one out in 2022. And I wouldn't hold my breath. All right, and it would still be- But it would be nice to have. I mean, it, it would be good to get it done. Seems like I recall the current FEMA map around circa 79. Yeah. Yeah, it's an old, old map. Okay, all right. Um, just before we move to the next agenda item, it seems an appropriate time to officially welcome Laura Ross to the planning board. Uh, Laura, you were just sworn yesterday, the day before, is that correct? She's muted. Yes, yesterday. Uh, oh, okay. no, actually, I'm sorry. It was Monday I went. Okay, so, awesome. Yeah, a couple days ago. And did you get your official copy of the zoning bylaws, I hope, to keep did under you your, your pillow? <laughs> um, I think I actually did not get them, but electronic really works better for me anyway, so that's okay. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Very good. All right, so let's um, let's move on to the discussion of zoning bylaws and bylaw changes for annual town meeting. Um, can someone just remind me, I was at last, at our last planning board meeting, did we defer or even, or, or vote on the removal of the growth control bylaw? I'm trying to remember whether we already approved that or we kind of, put th those decision, that decision off to this meeting. Does anyone happen to remember? I okay. think we put it off, but I'm not sure. Oh, we have minutes. Okay. We have minutes. Well, we don't have minutes. So it's right now going on our memory. So unless Mary happens to quickly be able to- No, Mary to can't, this. I'm sorry. Okay. Very good. So um, we're going to just assume for tonight that we didn't have a vote on this. Um, what I'd like to do is, because I think this is easy, it's the easier of the ones, just to remind everybody, we're gearing up to schedule a public hearing on bylaw changes that we want to get in front of annual town meeting. I'll remind people that already we've approved the new zoning map that changes the aquifer protection overlay district boundaries. And so we voted, we voted on that and we've voted and approved corresponding changes to the bylaw language. So we're going to have in our, and remind me, Judy, we, we can do multiple public hearings on the same night, of course, but each bylaw change gets its own public hearing, correct? No, we can, that's a topic for a public hearing. So we could put all of the changes in one public hearing? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. I wasn't a little sure of that detail. So we already are gearing up to do, we haven't set a time. I'm sort of notionally thinking that end of March, our next regularly scheduled planning board meeting date would be used for the public hearing. I mean, I, we haven't discussed it, we haven't agreed on that, but that would be my hope. And I wanna make sure before tonight is over, we've 
had that discussion agreed on that it would seem like we would have enough time to get all of our ducks in order for a public hearing at the end of March on the bylaw changes. Um, so the aquifer protection bylaw and zoning map would be in that public hearing. And then potentially if we vote to approve eliminating the growth control bylaw, which is article eight in its entirety, subsections 171-38 through 171-43. And if you want to always take a paper. Okay. Um, so I think we discussed that. I think there was a general sentiment that um, I mean, it's well motivated based on it? law. It's the very last article, Article 8, the growth controlled bylaw. Okay. That whole section um, in its entirety would be would be stricken because it's not consistent with um, legal opinions, the Mass Massachusetts Constitution. And we've never hit it. And we've, yeah, and there's no justification no. for it. That's right. So what I'd like to do, just to make this formal procedure, I'd like to hear a motion to strike Article 8 from the zoning bylaws in its entirety. Then, if that motion is made and seconded, we can have a discussion, see if there are any questions, concerns, then we can have a vote. I make a motion to strike Article 8 from the growth, growth control bylaw from zoning bylaws. Okay. The motion has been made. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. Sarah has seconded. Motion has been made and seconded. I'm sorry, the, but I could you please Article eight, Article 8 is called what? The Growth Control Bylaw. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we are voting, we're discussing a motion to strike it in its entirety. It's 171-38 um, through 171-43 in its entirety. Yes. I'm, I have every reason to believe that's a good idea. So I'm in favor of it. And I think that it would be easy to explain at town meeting, anyone who believes that less regulation is better would be in favor of it. The only potential concerns that I can see are people who like the idea of the growth control bylaw. So as a member of the finance committee, yeah. we are pro growth because it has new dollars to the tax base. Okay. So, um, speaking as an individual member of the finance committee, yes. yeah, and I'm not representing not the, finance. the finance committee, just right. as an individual member of it. Yes. All for eliminating this. Okay. Other comments, questions? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Uh, typical roll call, Sarah Cooper. Yes. Judy. Yes. JD. Yes. Uh, Laura can vote. I vote yes. Uh, can, can Laura vote? Can Laura vote? Um, I mean, we de de deliberated. Yes, she can. Okay. All right. Even though we've had discussions prior to this one, she, she was there. Out. She was there for the discussion. Okay. All right. Something about the camera and the video and the audio with her. Mac doesn't work right. So. Yeah. No, those Apple products just can't. Uh, so Laura, can you uh, vote a mute and I I did. vote yes. Okay. Okay. And I vote yes. I vote yes. So the motion passes unanimously, Mary. Strike Article Eight Growth Control. Next, I'm going to share some screen sharing. Judy has done a marvelous job of uh, drafting. Uh, Share screen. Uh, these are the members of the public part of our agendas. So they're just curious. Um, well, we have at least one person who just enjoys attending these meetings, even though he or she doesn't get cupcakes, and another person who is going to will uh, be here for the additional items not anticipated. Sure. Okay. okay. So again, we're going to do it. The way I propose, where I'd like to, um, I'd like to hear a motion, a second, then we have discussion and a vote. 
And then the usual process is whoever makes the motion for future reference, according to Robert's rules, speaks to the motion first after it's made and seconded. So Judy might consider making the motion on this one. Okay, I should I discuss the changes first? Since what you time? should do, I think, my recommendation, Judy, is you make the motion, we get it seconded, and then there's discussion, and, and then you speak to anything you want to speak to, including changes that have been made. Okay. Well, I move to accept the, re the proposed new community housing bylaw is depicted in the draft being shown. Motion has been made. Do I hear a second? I second it. JD has seconded the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. Judy, why don't you uh, tell us what changes have been made since we've last seen this and why they've been made? Okay. Um, they're in yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, they were came out of revisions that Megan wrote. Megan roads uh, suggested some of them and also some that I discovered in reviewing the state bylaws about special permits. Um, I had had originally that the units have permanent affordability requirements and Megan changed it to long term um, evidently to be eligible for the housing inventory, it doesn't have to be permanent, which I hadn't realized. So um, she wanted to take out the requirement that it be recorded with the registry of deeds. And I highlighted that because it probably should be discussed. I had originally had that in there because I felt it was, well, one, I thought it was necessary. Um, and two, I think it's important for enforcement as as we discussed at some length last yeah. time so mm -hmm. i left that in and i i do think it's a good idea judy was Wait, there a i had pretty much okay, so on, she gets to I'm she sorry. gets the floor yeah okay um i had put in <coughs> something about accessory apartments being included um and megan was uncomfortable with that because she thought it really didn't fit with the, the context. It was, it was a little out of place. So I changed, I took that out. And the, the idea is that the <coughs> relaxing the dimensional requirements would permit larger accessory requirements than, than the regular bylaws would. I'm sorry, I don't know why I can't talk tonight. Um, <coughs> So I changed, so I added um, occupant limit requirements um, in section B as because those wouldn't necessarily have been covered by the dimensional and density requirements. And then when I was reading, <laughs> after this discussion with, with Deborah Carney about special permits, I, I was reading the bylaw and uh, the state law, and it says that yes, indeed, towns can relax bylaw requirements and as for properties under special permit, but you have to, you have to identify caps on the number of units and any changes in occupancy. Now we had had a cap on the number of units as part of this, but we didn't have one on the number of occupants. And so I, I added that the occupant limits may not exceed five inhabitants. And I, th I think that's all granted. Is that it? Um, let's just see. And right now, the existing accessory apartment limits are two people. Yeah. And it didn't see. It didn't. I thought it was kind of opposite of the intent of the changes to allow a bigger apartment and then not allow more people to live there. So, 
So those are the changes and the ones you haven't seen. Um, just a reminder that this is intended to allow all of the same things that somebody could do with a 40B under the same conditions, uh, but by give, but also giving the town more control via special permit and site plan review, which they wouldn't have, it, which the town wouldn't have with a 40B. So there's no greater authority given to anybody, but the town has more control. What the builder gets is less paperwork, less hassle, well, I put hassle, burden of 40B application is very complicated and takes some time. So for a small project, this would be much easier, but it would give the town more control. Do you yield the floor, Judy? Okay. Um, questions? Yeah, Judy, Megan Rhodes, this is of the FERC cloud, correct? Just so people listening. And did she, for part A, when you said recorded with the registry of deeds, would she have a different opinion because she might think the attorney general might strike it? No, no. Um, I, I, think it, I think it came, just came part and parcel with taking out the permanent affordability okay um, with a permanent one it does specifically have to be recorded um i don't think there's a problem with this okay um the other thing about the occupant limit that concerns me um two parts one as a builder there's nothing in my code about how many occupants i can have in residence or dwelling unit. We talk about dwelling units. Yeah. And the, what drives the dwelling units is the size of the septic system. That's okay. what it says how many we can have per, not how many. We can have three bedrooms. We can have nine people in the bedrooms, but it goes by how many bedrooms we have. Okay. Yeah. And I'm concerned the, about the special, yeah, we say the we special have, permit would, would limit the occupants. I'm just saying we have a young family. Yeah. We have two children. They're trying for a third. Right. They end up with twins. Yeah. Are they now homeless? That's what I'm concerned about. Uh -huh. I think maybe just limit the number of bedrooms. I oh, interesting. we don't have we don't have that option. If I I think it says that they have to put a cap on the uh, you, you could do number of non-related people in the building. That's really an interesting twist I hadn't thought about. Um, but this was driven, Judy, because um, certainly we want to achieve the effect of, right now, without this, yeah. if you want to build an accessory apartment in Waverly, according to current bylaws, there can be no more, as written, you know, not, not even considering what you just described, is uh, that the occupant limit is two which I guess means two who are not going to have any children because the same what you, the same scenario you just described would apply today, right? Somebody's, a couple gets into an accessory apartment and they have a child and now they have to leave the accessory apartment. It's carefully left this, left the enforcement of this. I don't know how it's enforced, but I do know we have to, uh, the. I think the attorney general would reject it if we didn't have a cap on the number. I see. Look, and so we can't limit the number of bedrooms. We can't say it's an accessory. Clearly, it's not. We can't limit it to two bedrooms because it's an accessory use. Well, this would still be stuck with the two. You, you, the bylaw now says two people. Yeah. So unless well, you specifically create a way to waive that. Yeah. So the, we have a problem, an existing problem, potentially, in our bylaws that we're not addressing here, okay. just to how we're dealing with conforming accessory apartments. Mm -hmm. Here, we're trying to allow more develop more housing units to be built and certain um, rules in the bylaws to be waived mm -hmm. if this 25% long-term affordability is met, met, which I guess for an accessory apartment means 
if somebody wanted to build an accessory dwelling unit mm -hmm. and they said that, I assume, Judy, what that would mean is the entire accessory dwelling unit would be have to would have to have a long term affordability um, requirement, not yes. just one person. You know, it, it would have to apply to the entire dwelling unit. Well, so it would have to apply to the to the apartment. Yes, what, what what I'm saying is that if I wanted to build an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and I needed, I couldn't do it unless certain certain dimensional requirements and occupants limits were waived. With if this were approved in town, I could do that only if I declared that the only people who could live in that accessory dwelling unit that I was building would meet these um, <coughs> SHI requirements. Right? right, it could not be a market rate owner of uh, occupant. Do I is that an accurate statement, Judy? Yes. Yeah. Does, does this bureau represent to our housing committee? I am the representative for housing. Does, does this have any to the? I saw the conceptual plans for the Tobayo property. Does this would this apply to that property? That they don't think so at this point. They don't think so. Okay, but right now the. DeMeo property. They can't build. They can't build more than four units on the DeMeo property without this bylaw, without going through a forty B. Oh yeah, that's true. That's 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 true. And like three buildings, so there's you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, but that was just a conceptual. I know. Yeah. Reiterated that that was spitballing and not really a, a proposal. Um, so I, do, I I think what's happening is that. What you're saying, JD, about occupant limits versus bedroom limits makes a lot of sense, but this is not the place where we can fix that problem. Okay. If if we really shouldn't be trying to limit the size of the occupancy of accessory dwelling units um, by number of occupants for the reason that you say, but rather what we do, square footage, um, we could consider in the future modifying it to uh, be restrictions based on size and number of bedrooms and modify the, 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 the non-affordable housing I'm version sorry. of accessory dwelling unit yeah. to be about size and number of bedrooms and not size and number of occupants as it currently is. Right. Uh, but that's not what we're and dealing with. At that with. point, you can take this out too. I mean, then right. you can. Okay. So I think what we're acknowledging, if we go forward with this, it's written at this time that we're putting an occupant limit of five. Um, but we're acknowledging that enforcement of that is not really addressed. And there would be undesirable scenarios if it were uh, potentially undesirable scenarios if it were carefully enforced. So that if somebody, a couple with two kids or yeah, had twins, suddenly they have to leave their dwelling. This is made for a college town where they're trying to put yeah. eight students yeah. in a two bedroom apartment. But I don't think, and I suspect, Judy, that you know, there's absurd things. If they had been couplets, right? Yeah. You know, I don't think we're going to start raising the occupant limit in this particular draft beyond five. I think it's a it's an expression of intent or desire. Um, is that reasonable, Judy? Um, other yeah, I mean, but it's it's if it passes, it's a limit. Yes, but it's still the question would be, I mean, I suppose, how is that? So if I build, if I build an accessory dwelling unit and I declare that it's, uh, that that will only be rented to um, or leased 
to people meeting the, um, the affordable housing requirements. Uh, and then the ZBA waves all the various things so that I can do this. And now I don't know, the building inspector is not involved in occupancy, it. right? You know, renting, he's out of the loop here. Although so it's really just, I suppose it would be if it would be the way we do things in, in here in Wakely. It would be. Somebody complained. Mm -hmm. It would be a condition of the special permit. And then if over time somebody exceeded it, then somebody would have to complain. But I don't know. I mean, if you think about it, if you've got six people in a tiny apartment, they're going to want to get out if they can do so. Um, I I think that by, I, I wouldn't worry. I don't think that the enforcement issue is as bad a problem as we're making it. Um, I, I get, I would bet that it wouldn't be enforced, but I don't know. Is it but I do know that, I mean, we could take the whole thing out, but then, then you'd still be limited to the two, to the two inhabitants. Oh, uh, well, but no, you still want in part B to leave the new, the inserted occupant limit as within, within the realm of yeah. what could be. And made. I think we then have to have the cap. So um, yeah. I, think I think we, we just, I think we we're doing the best we can, what we have to play with. And we waive the occupant limit. Um, well, no. So what this would say is that Right now, the occupant limit is two. Good. We're if somebody came along and built one of these and made it, set it up for affordable housing, yeah. then they could legally allow as many as five people to occupy it. Okay. And and if six or more were in there, they might be able to get away with that until somebody noticed and complained. And then that would lead to some adjudication involving the building inspector. And and there, and then it's really the building inspector's decision. Is this a real concern coming forward with the number of people in our country working? Yeah, asylum or refugees living mm -hmm. from places with a large extent of families. I mean, this this could very well happen. Mm -hmm. And are we discriminating right. against those people? This only applies to accessory apartments. Okay. Yeah. It's not only, it's, yeah. anything else. Yes, this is only. This is only part E is only in there because of the accessory okay. dwelling unit piece. Okay. And I mean, ultimately, we're, you might say, anytime we're building anything, there's no capacity. Okay. Um, All right. I mean, I admit that I'm, I'm a little bemused by this, but I'm not sure that this sinks it in my mind. Okay. Um, I, I've had other concerns about accessory dwelling units, but we're not dealing with those now. Um, um, Judy, I do have a question. I do want to make sure I give some time to Sarah if she has questions or Laura, but I'll just insert one here in part A. Is um is long term in this context adequately defined? Is it clear to just use it that way? Do we have to add a definition? I, I'm often concerned when we add terminology to bylaws that seem either not defined in our bylaws. So that's my question. I think you look to the rest of it, the rest of the statement where it, you're, you're, you're defining the requirements. You look to the requirements of the Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Mm -hmm. So whatever they determine. So they have documents that use long-term affordability as a term, so somebody could find what that what those requirements are. Okay, somebody you could find the requirements of their requirements, and and yeah. Just out of curiosity, have you? So where did the term? Long You're the term... one on the housing committee, Grant, not me. Yeah, I know. Um, well, of course, again, this is new word. This, this was this was. This was Megan's wording. Okay. And so I'll 
I'll assume at this point that it's it's you know a term that would be understood if somebody had to say what are those requirements that they could be looked up and it wouldn't be ambiguous. That was really just the thrust of my question. Yep. And your point regard, regarding recorded with the registry of deeds means it just means that those um, that restriction is publicly available and versus some other entity unnamed would have to keep track uh, that these requirements have been um, placed. Is that correct? Correct. And and also it it enforces it effectively means that any owner of the property has to should theoretically have seen this because it's it's on a deed. So they have to know it's there. Yeah. Okay. Or they can certainly be held accountable for knowing it's there. Sarah, comments, questions. You all had very good comments and questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Laura, comments, questions? I, I thought um, there was good, valuable discussion, but I don't think that I have anything to add. Okay. And I think, um, I think there's still some things about this that I want to understand better, but I don't feel at this time, I don't see anything personally here that would lead me to feel that we cannot or should not take this to a public hearing. I would like to have state, like I'd like to make as much of an effort as we can and use all available um, advertising resources to make people in town aware of a public hearing where this is going to come up. I'd like, I would feel much more comfortable taking something like this before annual town meeting if there was some good engagement at a public hearing. Um, but still, I feel this ought to go to a public hearing. So I would be inclined to support it to the next step. So we've had our, the motion was made, the motion was seconded. We've had our discussion, um, last call for any discussion before we vote on the motion. Uh, Mary, you want to remind us what the motion is that we're about to vote on? Mary there? Maybe. Um, or Judy, you'll simply re repeat the motion for the record. I hope uh, that we approve the proposed community housing bylaw as outlined in this document. All right. Um, so we're going to do a roll call vote. And and I guess we should include the this section for the table of use. Yes, including the section the modifications to the table of use. Which means that it's this community housing use is allowed by special permit and with site plan review in AR1, AR2, and commercial, and not in commercial, industrial, or industrial. Okay, very good. All right, Sarah gets first vote. Yes. Judy, second vote. Yes. JD. Yes. Laura. Yes. All right, and I vote yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Um, I do have a, just a question, Judy. I, I, do you think there's any tricks or um, potential hitches around inserting this with a new number and renumbering all the subsequent, para subsequent paragraphs in the zoning bylaw? Could we end up actually having to get the entire, all the renumbered parts of the bylaw reviewed and approved by the attorney general if we do something? No. As simple as uh, renumbering? Lynn, Lynn told me once that uh, when she was town clerk that 
numbering is something that we can change without going to the AG. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was like a little procedural thing that I was worried about. Okay. So what we want to do next, having so now we've approved um, the aquifer protection changes, the zoning map, removing the growth control bylaw, and this new community housing bylaw. Was there anything else that I might have somehow forgotten that needs to go before a public hearing so we can get it to this year's annual town meeting? I think we're good, right? So how do people feel about scheduling? So let's talk about scheduling that public hearing. So a couple of things. We next need to take everything the the next step is to have all of these proposed changes what we voted on tonight here yeah. and the and the aquifer stuff yeah. all reviewed by town council yeah so i will take the action keeping you in the loop to request that town council review that should be done i'm told i send this over to brian well <laughs> Well, or who's ever going to be in Brian's shoes. They have an interim. They, have they got an interim already? So she was here yesterday. Oh, wow. Yay. Okay. Um, anyway, well, we're going to get this past town council. Town council will let us know if there are any concerns. Um, we can do that while we are in the process of scheduling and doing all the notice for the public hearing. But we, we should have feedback. should take about two to three weeks tops to get what I'm told, get a uh, review from my legal counsel. So I'll take that action to compile all of this in a package that can be sent to town council. Judy, I'll ask that when I do that, I'll run it by you in case I missed something or have never done this before. You'll keep me on the straight and narrow like you always do. I'll do my best. Okay, thank you. That's all we can ever ask. Um, so how do people feel about... Uh, one comment, Grant. Um, town Council will get it back on the deadline you specify and no sooner. Oh, is if that you're lucky. Right? Okay. All right. Well, it's... So I would specify like a Friday before the hearing or something, so we have time to digest it. Just so you to make any, uh, any adjustments they made? If, yes, if we, we can at a public hearing discuss and make changes yeah. at the public hearing. My understanding is that when we notice the public hearing, all the materials for the public hearing must already, must be available by the time the notice is posted. I assume that means that you're not allowed to change it except at the actual hearing. So we're talking notionally about Wednesday, the 27th of March, our next regularly scheduled planning board meeting date will be this public hearing for all of these bylaw changes. And everyone, is that good with everyone? And Mary, I know that you've been working on um, public hearing for the ZBA that I think was around the 13th or the 14th. Do you have the time in your calendar that help if, it looks like if we did this on the 27th of March, we would, have to so they do some it's like we have to at least have the public the first public notice in a newspaper of record around the what 11th or 12th 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 word it had to be 14 days in advance not counting so that would be 0 1 2 3 4 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 yeah, and so, I can work 
we, we've, we're a pretty good team, she and I, on this. Okay. To make these, but I just want to make sure that, Mary, you have the, um, you know, you have the cycles to work with Judy on that so that we can make the deadlines for a public hearing by the, to be held on the 27th of March. You are muted, Mary. You are still muted, Mary. And you're still sharing. Am I still sharing? Okay. <laughs> Yes, the, your answer your answer is yes. Uh, if it's going to be on the twenty seventh, there is still room to get that going. But awesome. If, if that was your question, to, <laughs> to yes. run the ads. Yes, very good. All right. And well, I mean, we have to get stuff together fairly quickly, but we can do that. All right. I'm not able to attend, but if you have a quorum, that's. But I won't be able to attend probably until anything until a couple of weeks after that. So I think, okay. So JD's confirmed, Judy's confirmed, I'm confirmed, and I assume Laura, you would be confirmed for the hearing on the 27th? Okay. Yep. Yes, I can make it on the 27th. Okay, very good. Any other details about that public hearing, Judy, that we need to discuss tonight? Got a date? That's plenty of time for getting things in order for annual town meeting. Yep. Are we going to try to sneak the beans in that day? Well, now that's the next thing that I wanted to. Excuse ask. me. So, sorry to interrupt, but I had to run out for a couple of minutes unavoidably, and I missed what probably was the vote on the yeah, uh, unanimous approval. Of the... Okay. Unanimous, unanimous approval. Yeah. Unanimous yeah. approval for. So the motion originally made by Judy, seconded by. GD, you seconded it, right? I seconded, yeah. Right? And so it was a big Very good. We added, uh, Mary, we added the uh, inclusion of the table of use section into the motion. So it's approval of the bylaw in the insertion in the table of use. Include. Excuse me, Grant. Include the bylaw in the table of use is what you're and the table of use and and the addition to the table of use all right so i think we're done with that agenda item are there any there's no other zoning bylaw changes that anyone wants to talk about and after after we get through all of this there will when we get maybe even the potential before town meeting, there are other things that have come up, whether it's about accessory dwelling units or about aquifer protection or solar that we need to consider for a future town meeting. We'll get started on that as soon as we the dust settles on this coming town meeting. We are not, we have no new notes. JD asked about the beans hearing and- Yes, and so the beans hearing, do we, there is one wrinkle there. Um, a special permit requires a super, requires a two thirds approval, which means you need four votes. So a quorum isn't enough. Um, right. If, if yeah. Vera knows she can't come, then everybody else really has to be there. Yeah, that's right. I'll be there. Um, and just so we know, Sarah, what's your, when is your availability window reopening? Meaning you could come to these meetings. I, uh, from the March 20th to, I am very much hoping two weeks after that, and uh, oh. that I will start being able to be semi-coherent. Okay. Surgery Fair and once enough. I'm I don't want to be on a meeting if I'm on if I'm on narcotics. And so yeah. So uh, to Judy's point before, worst case scenario, it would I'm get hoping April. meeting the first week of Yeah, April. what we would end up awesome. doing is especially if it all gets scheduled and it's moving, then we would convene the public hearing and then um continue it to another date. Continue it. And and we would 
not have to do more advertising or okay. anything like that. That's fair to I'm, I'm expecting second or third week in April, I'll be coherent. Okay, all right, well, obviously your health is the most important thing. Um, so I think we can do this and with, with four votes, uh, it doesn't seem like there's any obvious reason why this could work. Now the question is, well, I mean, it does not seem like a public hearing on the common driveway and the side lot is all that complicated. And it seems like it could be. Get, I don't think you'll get anybody there who wasn't at our discussion tonight. Yeah, right. I mean, there's no. I letters. would schedule it before the other, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be so over five time. minutes. Okay. Well, that would certainly make them happy, and it would. I'd be happy to just not have that hanging over us. Yeah. Either. Okay. All right. Um, but it does create this additional burden of more paperwork, right? Because again, there are additional butter letters, other notices. That's so it's no. Uh, well, they have to pay for it. Yeah. But we have. No, to they do don't. We never, we never included applicants paying on on special permits because we have so few we didn't think of it. All right, so we eat the cost of that. It shall be. But I mean, so far we haven't spent any of our budget. So um but that's still not the issue. I'm just worried about the labor on the volunteer and staff and in, in Mary, and that now that's yet another set of more invoicing and things dealing. I've with never done children. that before, but I'll go my way if I need to do something. So I'm sure Laura will too. Judy, how are you feeling? I mean, I'm totally happy to help out, but it puts us into a bit of a crunch over the next week or so to get all of this stuff together so it can move along. Well, there's a couple weeks for the hearing, for the ad. I mean, I don't think. Yeah. It would be the 11th or 12th. Or 10 days, so. Yeah. So the hard part. Drafting the ad for the special permit is, permits is, is fairly straightforward. The one for the zoning stuff is a little more complicated. It, I would like to apprentice to know how to do this with yeah. Judy to her leaving the board. Yeah. We do know how to do this, and I don't know how to do it. So that would be that would be ideal. Yeah. That would be ideal. Okay. So we're going to commit to trying to pull all of this off. Uh I mean these two public hearings on March 27th. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. People comfortable with that? Slate JD, you stepped up and you're doing this. I know you're doing this during finance committee season too. Be careful what you I was back to do that. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I like want to the other the planning board. I do right. not want to be on the finance committee. Okay. So, now I've, you know, I have an engineering background and I always learned to like set very conservative deadlines, and I would tend to push this. Out two weeks into April, but um, if we want to take a take a shot at this, the worst thing is we miss a deadline. End up having to do it in April. But let's try it. Okay, if you're all willing, try to do it end of March. Um, okay, so we're now we're not doing any approval of minutes. Um, we're into the additional items, not a anticipated period there are a couple of things that i want I, well there's one thing i'm gonna we're gonna have i know mike Yusa has been hanging out here so we're gonna get to him um i just want to remind people i think i circulated this information but um, particularly for you jb laura um there is uh I think I, there is a, I'm just trying to find my, the training. my email on this uh, conference. So in general, we can pay training costs out of the planning budget. 
there is a upcoming didn't i circulate this yeah i got something from you to uh it's at worcester in um old cross yeah and it's on a saturday and i'm planning on going it's like an all-day thing with a bunch of different workshops covering a whole bunch of worthwhile subject matter and if you can get free on a saturday saturdays or weekends are tough being a father of a young family i know in a business owner it's tough but i, know. I will do my best right but now. we can tough. carpool i'll have leftover cupcakes <laughs> so they have other classes that are shorter but are yeah they're almost good so just in general, I'm going to try to keep when I see these okay. training things coming up, I'll alert you guys to it and you can register and okay. get reimbursed for the training. Okay. But if if you can go or go together, we should do that. Um, okay. So what I want to... Additional items. Uh, yeah, we're in the additional items now. Mike Busa's here. Mike, you want to go live on video and audio and you've you've uh, suffered this long. So oh I spend lots of times in long meetings so this is no this is actually not so bad. Okay. Well if you've been here you would have gotten cupcakes. All right. So what I want to try to do here is bring up this the assessor's map. So we can look at the parcel in question. Uh, and I gather, Judy, you've been, you've had some conversations with the CBA. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. Let me share my screen. Let me see. Oh, yes, I'm sharing the online assessor's map. You don't see that. We zoom in on Weber Road on its parcel five. So, so, Mr. Busta, you are, correct me if I'm wrong, you are considering purchasing parcel five is that correct or you have purchased parcel five so i have an accepted offer on parcel five i see so so you're i'm sorry you're the seller no I'm, i would be the buyer you're yes so you have made an offer on uh, that on parcel five that's been accepted by the seller and correct you're or you would like to build a single family home on this lot. Uh, it is a building lot in the sense that it has the required frontage. It has the required, but well, it has the it meets the dimensional requirements, though it has this common driveway. Is this or a there is a well, it's a it's effectively a shared driveway. Is that um... there's a special permit that has been approved for that to have be a shared driveway for both uh, lots four and five is pictured there. Right. And the issue is that because of the presence of this common driveway, it reduces the area of the parcel available for building. And it puts the, now you'll notice the Western boundary, 570 feet, if I can do this right. So what's coming up here is this, what Mr. Buser would like to do is measure length. So I, if I do this right, do this so, this is approximately, this is just an approximation. So this is approximately where the AR1, AR2 boundary falls in parcel five, mm -hmm. all right? And I believe that what Mr. Busa wants to do, or because of the 
layout of the land relative to this common driveway, the desired placement of the single family home would be beyond the AR1 boundary into AR2. Fair statement? Uh, we need a much more detailed site survey to make that final site plan determination, but in all likelihood, yes. I have a question. Is that at the end of the existing driveway, is that the house that's shown there with the 616 and the 40 and the 12? Is that the house that's existing? No, this is the end of the driveway. This is where okay. my little red axis moved. So is there a house there right now? No, there's a house over here. Oh, the house is way. Oh, I couldn't see that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah so, so the, the driveway, the common driveway ends where that ends, yes. where the, the sort of um, right of way ends there. There is a continuation of a paved driveway that goes up to the sort of back side of that house. Okay. But that is that's not considered part of the common driveway or I think covered under the special permit. Okay. And there's no uh, separation distances for water wells or septic systems of where you want to put your house. So the the primary consideration here is that this is quite a steep slope. <laughs> And yeah. really it is only once you get south, the sort of switchback in the driveway that cuts across that lot five, uh, actually the, the lower one, Brent. Yeah, here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so this is it's quite steep below that. You wouldn't be able to build a house in between Weber Road and the lower part of the driveway because of the cut in the hill. There's such steep grading there that there really isn't the possibility of actually putting a whole house septic and well within the AR1 setback. I think that in all likelihood that the site plan will be in, will will have some portion of it in AR1, but will cross the boundary into AR2. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Where did it perk? Uh, we haven't perked it yet. Well, what brought us here is that it appears based on a reading of the bylaws and having spoken to Jim Hawkins, he concurs with this reading, that when the principal, the residential structure is placed fully within the AR2 zone of that parcel, the, the dimensional requirements of AR2 must apply in full to the portion of the parcel that lies within AR2. And they're different? Well, you'll notice that this entire parcel is approximately three acres, right? But again, sort of imagine drawing the first two thirds of it roughly, I'm just doing a rough approximation, lie within the AR1 zone. The rest of that parcel is in AR2. Yeah. The dimensional requirements just for minimum lot size up there, lots without public water in AR2, 120,000 square feet. Three acres. Three acres, which is basically the size of the entire lot. But the way our bylaws are written, the portion of that lot that falls within AR1 is excluded from that calculation. And so the we currently believe and this is, does not seem to be a desired outcome of the creation of the AR1, AR2 districts. But in this particular scenario, it seems to mean that the only way Mr. Busa could build his single family home on that parcel and place it within the AR2 zone is to obtain a variance from the DBA because he would not form to the minimum lot size, even though the lot in its entirety is 120,000 square feet and has the desired, the, the, the necessary frontage. So Mr. Bean will have the same issue, but he's not. Well, we don't know. He's got seven acres. I, I didn't really want to go there, right? It looked to me that if he's got seven acres of which the front part is in that flagpole area, yeah. 
he might have more than 120,000 square feet in that lot beyond the AR1 boundary. So he's probably okay. But Mike here is in a... So the house has to be touching the AR1 area? <laughs> that, that is part of my question. I, I would actually, I don't know that the interpretation that, at least from the conversations that I've been a part of for the interpretation of the bylaws, were that you had to have 120,000 square feet in AR2. I think it's that you had to have it in total. But the problem is, is that you have to have 300 feet of frontage. And so this lot is clearly lacks 300 feet in frontage. It, it doesn't likely lack 300 feet in its maximal width because of that sort of like elbow portion at the top. But I know that doesn't really matter. Um, but, but yeah, it right. seems like we're running into some, some, right. so some the challenges test, here. Could I, Judy, since you were present, if not, a player in the creation of AR1 and AR2. Could you say a little bit about what was the planning board's intent at the time that AR2 was created? Um, like what was the, what, what, what would you say is the policy objective of, of creating AR2 and setting it 400 feet back from the right of way? We created AR2 as a way to enable cluster so cluster housing um, in a town with no sewers, you there's a, a it's very difficult to reduce the size of a lot enough to um, cluster. So the idea was to expand to create a zoning area with expanded acreage. And then give people the incentive to build together in clusters, um, and and preserve open space. This, at the time, this was in two thousand ten. People were extremely worried about too much development taking agricultural and open space land. So this was a way to do smart what they call smart growth mm -hmm. by putting houses closer together um consolidating driveways and roads as much as possible reducing sprawl and it was amazingly easy to get through town meeting we thought we'd have some objections but the idea of preserving open space if you read the cluster housing bylaw i mean it it goes on and on and on about open space yep. and right. preserving. And um, as I said earlier, um, we didn't think through this kind of issue and we really didn't do a very good job of designing access. Yeah, there's <laughs> some. And it just literally never occurred to anybody. Yeah. Yeah, so we've been and, and including this. including FERCOG, you know, we, we used we had lots of support from FERCOG and other planners. And so I think it's it's a I would say it's a definitely a less than perfect job, but it is what it is. Yeah, the um I'm trying to find I thought I had my fingertips on it. Where is that? Where is that provision that, that speaks to an additional thirty feet beyond the the, the boundary? That the principal use extends. It talks about split boundaries and. Let me just ask. So this, the, and, and the, so the, the thirty foot the thirty foot extension is one seventy one dash five e. Oh, thank, thank you. Fun. Like I should thank you, Mike. It's embarrassing that I don't have this memorized, but anyway. yeah. Uh, okay. I, I've so, read this document front to back so many times yeah. recently. Where but... no district boundary other than blah, 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 divides a lot in existence, which is this. You know, residential use is what he wants to do, maybe extend it up to 30 feet into the adjacent district from 
from AR1 into AR2 so in this case, he would get 430 feet, but he likely needs to build beyond 430 feet. And then the question well, it's is- It's 430 feet from the right of way, from not the right from the road. Way. Yeah. So I but don't know what the right of way there is. He might get oh. another 15 or 20 feet. Yeah, that gives you even more because the town owns the first 10, 15 feet of your property. So right. he's got- so, Yeah. So the question is, is whether I have, if I have to begin there or end there. Yeah. So yeah, if, the well, site if the site plan starts within that, if the requirement is the site plan starts within, say, 430 feet of the right of way, there's, I think, a reasonable chance that that would, that would fit, right and fit within it's area one. The, it's specifically it's 400 feet from the right of way. But it doesn't say starts, Judy, right? It just has to, the use may be extended. So I think- AR1, the definition of AR1 is 400 feet from the right of way. Right. But this but, person- next And the right of way varies with just about every street in town, so. Um, but let's, Judy, I think that game, that if, if we draw a, a line in parts in lot five, where the outer edge of that, uh, you know, 400 feet from the right of way plus 30 feet, can his building has, can his house must the, um, the edge of his house that is furthest away from the right of way start at that line or end at that line or touch that line? Well, you'd have to ask the building inspector if yeah. was he obviously I would I would think that as long as it was if it ended at that line, it would be fine. And the septic could go wherever. It's the house. If the house was in the if it was in the property if it touched it, I would say it's in it. Yeah, but that's a building inspector. So this seems to be an issue. That needs... We can't. We can't define this. This is Jim Hawkins. Yeah, yeah we can't. But there, this may be a bug that we need to fix at some time soon. Yeah, if we can figure out. Well, how I to think fix. the bug is access frontage, because I think there's the frontage issue is a problem. Well, well, this there's is why you're asking this policy objective question. Like by creating AR2, I understand that AR2, the, the creation of AR2 was driven by the desire of adding this cluster, cluster zoning bylaw. But it seemed to, because AR2, the AR2 zone in Waverly is so you know, pervasive, we've We've essentially said there are certain kinds of things that we do and don't want to happen within AR2. And maybe I'm asking, do we not really want residential structures built in AR2? Is the policy goal of AR2 to limit single family construction in, in AR2? Like basically, was AR2 trying to achieve the goal of preventing Mr. Busa from doing what he wants to do by limiting principle? No. Or is just a- I told you what the goal was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. We wanted, yeah. nobody wanted to limit residential housing. We wanted to keep it from being in large developments like Pine Plains. Okay. Well, obviously, there were other policy objectives with AR2 leading to making the minimum lot sizes larger and changing the frontages and so forth. And you say all of that was just driven all in conjunction with the open space cluster bylaw. Entirely. So then no one said, you know what, we want to protect the land in Waitley that sits more than 400 so feedback from town rights of way and require large lots back there if you're going to do single family homes or and then in fact we want to create AR1 
to encourage single family homes to be built close to roads or at least within 400 feet. No, we, that was we, created, we created AR1 because that's where most houses were built. We, we essentially replicated the existing. I see, okay. And I, and I noted that, and, and Judy concurred that there was, there's an interesting internal inconsistency between what we've encountered here, that it does seem like Mr. Busa might need to obtain a variance depending on the placement of his single family home within this parcel. But if you looked into the flag lot, this is not a flag lot. So flag lots don't apply in this case. Um, but in the flag lot bylaw, which is 171-24-1, there's an interesting parrot part B that says for minimum lot size and other dimensional requirements, a flag lot shall be considered to be in the district where it has street frontage. So that like parcel four, if parcel four were a flag lot, which I don't think it is, because it has to have a, be declared as such or have a permit as such, but if four here were a flag lot, then the entire parcel four flag lot would be considered an AR1 because it has frontage there, which seems like an interesting idea. Well, that would totally invalidate the premise behind including AR2. <laughs> Yeah, right. This would be a workaround to AR2. No, it would, it would, it would, it would undermine the premise for creating AR2, which was to create bigger lots. It was a deliberate attempt to encourage, uh, encourage preserving yeah. open space by encouraging people to cluster. And people uh, could get more housing. You can get more housing in a cluster than you could with the old zoning. So it allowed greater density, but it, it required a certain specificity about the where the way it was created. So it, it certainly wasn't intended to undermine single family housing. You can get up to 50, 70% more in a cluster zoning unit. But it requires you to set aside a certain amount of open space in doing it. Cluster housing is cheaper. Well, I don't but think we, that- And, and the assumption was that, of course, you would be building a road. So there would be frontage for the cluster housing. Yeah, so in this case, this particular scenario is an unintended adverse outcome of all of this. Yeah. Yes. And there's no reason to believe that we as a town want to prevent Mr. Busa from building a single family home on his parcel wherever he can place it. And really, I don't think we particularly should care where he places that parcel relative that AR1, AR2 boundary. But the bylaws, I'm just the way they are. This is probably not the case, but Northampton Public Water goes by his house. You're not allowed to tie into it though, right? Yeah. I don't, no. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that we we don't have much, we don't have much help to offer to you, except I think we have concurrence on what your situation is and that it's not, it wasn't anything intended by the planning board when the AR1, AR2 districts and boundaries were created. Sure, um, part, part of the reason that I've been kind of pursuing this and wanted to open the dialogue around it is that the most recent redrawing of lot five was in 2015. And my understanding is that it was with the express purpose of allowing that upper zone to conform to the bylaws. It doesn't appear that that was successful and that's not anybody's problem on this call. Um, but it does, you know, it does seem uh, 
sort of the interpretation of the bylaws I have is that it does the lot does appear to conform to the square footage requirement, but doesn't conform to the frontage requirement for AR2, which is um, unfortunate. Well, uh, but but yeah, that yeah. does but it does also seem that like I have also gone through all of the the ZBA portion of the of the code and all the variants, and it does seem that while this may be an uh, unintended consequence that the the requirements for obtaining a variance that this type of lot actually kind of checks all the boxes for something that might be likely to obtain that uh, so i think from for my purposes really in the position that i'm in with this property is that i with contractually where i am with it i should be able to go conduct the survey, develop a site plan, and bring the site plan before the ZBA and obtain a variance before I would go further. And and I think really what I'm I'm just trying to get my order of operations correct here, so that I understand yeah. where things stand with the with, with the lot. Well, I wish you luck. I think I think that's the right procedure. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I appreciate the the feedback. I think that's that's really helpful. Just trying to not get too far ahead of myself with this, and and, and understand, you know, you trying to limit. Research. What was that? I commend you for doing all your research. Oh. I wish most people were as thorough. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll um, hopefully it hopefully it pans out in the end. So, I, I appreciate. Was Michael, as a builder, yeah, um, I strongly recommend you get a perk test and know where it's going to go because that's going to drive everything and where that house is going to be in that property. Either of the no, it's a, that's a that's the number one thing you got to know. So is yeah, that, contractually the yeah contractually the seller is on the hook for the perk test. What we want to do is we what we need to get we were going to run the survey first so that we have a better idea of like where we might want to put the the site plan and then once we have that we'll we'll perk it in in the appropriate place. Okay. Yeah. There's also um, soils can be tough out there, and you can you have the the soils tested at UMass in lieu of um, the the physical waiting for the water to go down the hole. They can just take a sample, bring it to UMass, and they'll they'll tell you there. Oh, that's, okay. Yeah. That's, that's good to that's good to know that that's helpful. So, yeah. Is that through the wet center? They'll do that. Your engineer will do that that does the perk test. He'll send it to UMass okay. lab and they do it. Okay. There's a whole chain of custody of things. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. So, great. When in a, in a case like this where um, a property goes before the ZBA seek a variance, is there any precedent or use or purpose or even appropriateness for the planning board to provide any input to that decision making? Like would no. we have a right to share of support? We would not. They don't have to have site plan review for us. No, it's not site plan. I'm just saying that if yeah. he's going to the ZBA, does the planning board variances are are totally up to them. Sure. I am, I do understand that. Is it a variance or a special permit? The variance. It would be a variance against the dimensional requirements because again the, the point is if the interpretation is that the minimum lot size has to be the sub portion of the parcel within AR2, then there's no way to beat that without a variance. Uh, I actually think that in the conversations that I've had with Jim Hawkins is that it's actually the opposite. It's that I meet the dimensional requirements. I do not meet the frontage requirements for AR2. So I have the 120,000 square feet and it's total lot size. If I only have 200 feet of frontage and not 300, that is the problem. But that's so weird because then what he seems to be saying is that the 300 feet is the frontage required for a parcel in AR2. Normally we would look at your parcel which fronts on a public way and say it's an AR1. And the rules of AR1 would apply to it mm. in its entirety. And what Jim seems to be telling you is that if you choose to place your single family dwelling in the AR2 portion of your parcel, now 
all the rules for AR2 apply to the entire parcel, including the 300 foot frontage requirement. Yep. And that, well, that seems. That, well, that seems like it's actually, it, it, as, as I hear it, it seems like what Judy has explained is the intent of it actually kind of makes sense to me is that if you're going to have larger parcels you want they wanted larger frontage and really make people spread out versus try to get them to be close together yeah but so, only when they're clustering not when they're doing single family sure sure and so i think but but i think either single way family is clustering if they're not mutually exclusive right you get a bunch of single family homes together right that's yeah um okay but i think I mean, I think either way it does seem that this, the topography of this lot, because Hog Mountain is so steep right there, really is dri is driving the placement. I, I said this in my message to the zoning board that like, if it worked out that I could fit the whole thing in AR1 and get around and not have to deal with this, I would. But I just don't think that's the that's the case. I'm just trying to figure out what the when that eventuality doesn't play out, then okay, how, what, what are the necessary steps? And so I think- yes, some... There's certain Title V rules about how much naturally occurring soil you have over a ledge, which you probably have up there. In my experience, we've had to move systems four or 500 feet away to make them comply to that rule. Yeah, so, so one of the interesting things about this lot that is just a little bit of an aside is actually the section where it, where talking about wanting to build is that it actually gets pretty far away from the ledge at that point and is it becomes much much flatter and more like a lot of the rest of the valley where it's much much sandier soils and yeah. so in some ways it's like the lot sets up really well and there's a natural location to put a residence there it's just that it happens to straddle this boundary and create a zoning complication but i think that being said it's in, in, in reading the laws and having had plenty of conversation at this point, it seems like a variance is gonna be the way that needs to happen. And, and but it also appears as though the, the rule, the regulations around the variance, while the conforming zoning bylaws, this may be an uh, unintended consequence, it does actually appear as though the variance guidance was actually set up pretty well to handle this. And so oh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, obviously, right, the zoning board will do what it does, but, but we'll try to make the case. But yeah, I appreciate everybody's feedback. Thank you. All right. Thank you. It's late and um, we're at the end of our agenda. So um, are Brent, there Sylvia any? Sylvia has been here for a bit. Excuse me? Sylvia has been here for a bit. Oh, I see. Rega oh, she joined us regarding, I thought we passed the floodplain bylaw update. Sylvie. Hi. Did you? Think she did. She. She's not. I don't think she's aware that we. I tried to cover it in your absence. Um, oh. Um, uh, I got logged on maybe like ten minutes late, but I didn't realize we'd already gotten through it. But um, that's okay. Um, I um, I, I don't know what you went over already, but um, I had spoken to Nadia, um, and uh, she felt that the the floodplain bylaw was in good shape um uh and um my understanding is that the the most recent draft that i have incorporates all, any comments that she may have given you in the past um before my arrival um but uh, she didn't she didn't personally foresee too many um difficulties with what we had been um, talking about with our agricultural exemptions, um, but uh, she also sent me the floodplain management um, requirements for agricultural structures document um, that um, Grant and, and Judy, you may have had a chance to take a little bit of a look at. So that should be helpful um, in uh, forming our application process. Um, and I've taken a look at a few other um, floodplain development permit applications, um, and I've reached out to Jim also to see if I could talk with him a bit about it. Um, haven't done that as of yet, um, but that's kind of where things stand for now. I don't know if you have any feedback you want to share with me, but um, you said uh, you've been exchanging communications with Scott Jackson. 
Oh, yes. Um, so I, I did talk to Scott and um, his concern, I think, was not um, uh, that the CONCOM might um, be, you know, having some um, participation in the application process, but just that uh, the town administrator or, um, you know, me or whoever is de uh, designated as a floodplain administrator would be the one who would be um, uh, making a final recommendation on on allowing the permit or not. Um, so I, I did um, reach out to him again just to ask um, if he had any particular um, concerns about the language in the bylaw um, as it pertains to the CONCOM. Um, so I'll let you know about that. But um, I, I, I suspect that uh, as long as the CONCOM is not, um, you know, wielding the bylaw um, independent of me or whoever else might be the uh, floodplain administrator, that they would have no problem um, you know, playing a part in the process. Um, but I will confirm all of that. You mentioned something in your email to me about establishing principles for mm -hmm. the, that's maybe not the right word, uh, that Scott had agreed um, that they could advise given that there was a set of principles that they'd be working from. Well, I think that we need to um, have the, develop the, well, one thing I wanted to ask Jim is just, I, I, I know that we probably have, you know, permitting applications that um, we can um, sort of go off of, and we need to develop um, a floodplain permitting application that would be independent of that. Um, and I think that if we have some guidelines um, that would be tied to that application, um, that's what Scott was talking about, I think, yeah. is have hmm? Go ahead. I, I oh. agreed. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, as long as we have those um, criteria that we're looking at um, for for that review process, um, and and then we're going through and and uh, making sure that whatever project is um, uh, is brought to us is meeting those criteria and going through the proper procedure, then then that would be acceptable. It was my my impression. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you Any all. Other, thank you. Any other business before we wrap up? Hearing none, I'll just, before I take a motion to adjourn, I'll remind everyone, we're going to, you and I are going to do a little signing, little touring the signing party here. Yep. Uh, and I'll let everyone know when ANR is ready, you can come down and do more signing. And we have actions to prepare for two public hearings for the end of March, one on the Bean Common Driveway and the other on the zoning bylaw. Do we need all signatures on that? We will need at least three. Okay. So we'll get Sarah, two to tonight. Come tomorrow. Yeah. And I'll get that all up. So just that will all be situated. Sarah, you have the key. I'll put it on the same tabletop with a Sharpie in the room that we have for the planning board down the hall where the assessor used to sit. Okay, and then we I think three is gonna be enough, but Judy, if you wanna come on down and add your yeah, signature, okay. you can feel do that. Okay, very good. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Oh, wait, 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 Sarah. I have a couple other signing questions. Oh, you please. and Judy and I have been talking about something we need to sign. Will that be there? Hello? I'm a little behind on that. Now I have, but I will. That is, it's, it's coming. <laughs> no it'll probably be, it'll probably be like, I'll get to the printer like this weekend and early next week. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. And also, Mary, are there some things for me to sign? We never got back to Brant, I think. That's all done. The the okay. invoicing for the nurse farm. Uh, thing is done, signed, sealed, delivered. So we're all up to date on that. Okay. So our bills are up to date. Our bills, as far as we know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion yeah. made, seconded. Sarah seconded it. I think that's good enough for me. We're adjourned until uh, our next public hearing at the end of March. Thank Good night. you all.